Hi everybody, this is Nate Smith, and you're watching my episode of Vic Firth's Stories Behind the Sleeves. I've played a lot of different sticks over the course of my career and I've been in search of the perfect size, um, one that allows me to get the articulations I want as well as not have to exert so much energy to play. And I think we really knocked it out of the park with the signature stick. So I've been talking to the team at Vic Firth for a while about a signature stick and we'd been going kind of back and forth with different models, different sizes, different weights. And so when I finally got the size that turned out to be this stick and I, I picked them up, held them, warmed up with them and then played with them for the first time, it felt like the perfect fit for me. So over the course of putting the stick together, um, the team at Vic first sent me a bunch of different samples of stuff and I played it on sessions, I played it at gigs, I, I warmed up with it. And we kept tweaking it until we got to the right size for me. The length was a big deal, the weight was a big deal, the tip shape was a big deal. And so we, you know, I, I, we went back and forth and they sent me this perfect pair, it's perfect for me now and it feels like they really knocked it out of the park. I think the first session I played, the first recording session I played with this prototype, um, I, when I listened back to my playing, I was like, man, I must, I sounded really comfortable with these sticks, you know? And it allowed me to explore like a really wide dynamic range and I didn't feel like I was working so hard. So that's when I knew we, we found the right fit. So when we were putting the stick together, I knew that I wanted something that was kind of between a 7A and an 8D. Um, this has the length of an 8D with a slightly smaller diameter. I've always been a fan of wood tips. I've always been a fan of rounded wood tips. Um, I like the way they feel on the cymbal. I feel like I get a really good articulation across different parts of the cymbal and on the bell. And I love to use the, the, the tip of the stick to play different parts of the hi-hat too. And I get the right color every time I play it. So that's why I kind of wanted to stick with that for this design. So not only does the tip shape give me great articulation on the cymbals, it also gives me great articulation across the drums. Um, not everything I'm playing is a rim shot. I'm actually playing the center of the drum a lot. I play a, a varying uh, dynamic range on the drums. So when I'm playing, I use that, the, the shape of that tip um, to get different sounds, different colors out of the drums, different parts of the drums. The stick has a medium taper, and so that gives me a variety of colors when I'm playing in different settings. So when I'm playing with kinfolk, if I'm playing cymbals and I want them washier, I use a lot more of the shank of the stick. Um, and when I'm playing with somebody like DJ Scratch, where I need to play a lot louder, I'm playing shots, that, that girth gives me the right uh, sound every time I hit a, a shot on the snare drum. Um, so it really helps the sound project, and, it, and I don't have to do that much work because of the weight of the stick. And I said, damn, man, these sticks sound good.
So today I want to talk a little bit about um, dynamics in playing touch and tone on the drums, uh, particularly as it relates to ghost notes and playing uh, in the context of groove playing. Um, I get a lot of questions about it um, from students and when I do master classes and, and stuff. So I want to kind of unpack a little bit of that and talk about my concept around playing uh, that kind of language on the drum set. So it all for me starts with rudiments. Um, I grew up in marching band in high school and uh, one of the things that I continue to, to use to this day are my high school warm-ups, my, my marching band warm-ups. And it seems really simple, but some of these warm-ups are like really fundamental building blocks to get me to sort of check in with my hands while I'm playing. So I always tell my students, while you're playing, talk to your hands. Talk to your hands. Think about what your hands are doing. Check in with your whole body while you're playing drum set, but particularly your hands because obviously you need to be playing at different dynamics. You need to make sure that you're playing parts clearly and, and they, the parts are articulate, you know. So that's, that's a part of the reason why I'm, I, I start with these very, very basic uh, warm-ups. Um, the first warm-up that I play is called the sprinkler, and when you hear it, you'll hear why. So it starts with eight notes on the right, eight more on the left, that repeats, and then two bars of 16th notes. So I start that exercise, I play it really loud and really slow. And as I get faster, I get softer. And playing fast and soft kind of trains me to check in with my hands as I'm doing it because I have to really make sure that I'm keeping that dynamic level down as I'm getting more fast, which is, you know, as, as drummers sometimes we have a tendency to play louder when we play faster. But, but in this particular exercise, I'm focusing on really making the, the dynamics um, very articulate, making the strokes articulate but at a very specific dynamic. So the next warm-up I do is a pattern that revolves around flam accents, and I displace the accent um, each time the, the, the bar goes around. And what that does is it gets me thinking about a grid, and I always mark time with my feet. So I'm always left, right, left, right, right? I'm doing that while I'm playing. What I didn't realize when I was doing this in marching band in, in high school, I didn't realize that marching while playing was actually training me about four-way independence. I, that was a, a, you know, that's something I didn't realize until I sat down at the drum set, and why is this so natural to me? Well, I've been walking and playing for the last two years in, in high school band. So I've, I've kind of developed that, um, this exercise while I'm marking time so that I can really get into playing over the bar line, displacing the accent, but never losing the grid. So I'll play this exercise, I'll start it again pretty slow, and as I speed up I get softer, but I play the left foot obviously on the hi-hat, the right foot on the kick drum, and I keep that grid going while I'm playing over the bar line. Um, this, this trains me to start thinking about playing against the time. Um, it, it, it kind of trains my brain to always know where the pulse is, regardless of where the accent is. Um, so that's, that's one of the key things that I use when I'm, when I'm playing this exercise.
So the third exercise I usually do revolves around the flam tap. Um, and as you know, the flam itself involves one stick playing a very soft grace note and another stick playing a loud note. When you're alternating flam taps, what you're doing is you're actually training your hands to go from loud to soft. And that dynamic range is really crucial when playing um, groove-oriented ghost note language. I think that's actually the secret ingredient that helps me to articulate all that ghost note language between beats. One of the biggest challenges with all these exercises is kind of fighting the impulse to play faster and louder. I'm constantly making a choice to play softer as I get faster, which is sometimes counterintuitive to the way a lot of drummers play. Um, and I think that that dynamic range helps to, to make all of the inside ghost notes speak more when I'm actually playing them uh, in, the con in a musical context. The tendency is to think about the ghost notes as occurring only on the snare drum. But the truth is, if you're playing funk or groove or whatever, I think the dynamic range on the hi-hat is important too. And a lot of our favorite break beats, a lot of our favorite drummers, they're playing with a really light touch uh, on the hi-hat. And they're actually bringing out different shades and colors of the hi-hat when they're playing. We don't even really realize it while we're listening to it. Um, but this is actually a big part of what makes that language work. So as you're shedding these different rudiments, particularly the flam rudiments, which require loud to soft very quickly, um, think about that when you're playing the hi-hat too. I, I, you know, that's, that's something that a lot of drummers don't really think about. We think about the, the ghost note as only happening in the left hand. But it's happening on the ride cymbal, it's happening on the hi-hat. All that stuff is working together. Another thing that might be helpful about these exercises is moving them around the kit. So maybe not just playing them on the snare drum and hi-hat, maybe playing them on ride cymbals too, um, maybe playing them across toms, you know, and seeing how that works and seeing how you're, you're able to sort of artic use those articulations across the drum set. Um, it'll definitely add a dimension of dynamics to your playing.
in a lot of my favorite records, um, the ghost notes on the snare drum and the hi-hat become a part of the rhythm section. Like it helps to sort of fill out the groove. So you might hear a rhythm, a rhythm guitar playing a figure and a bass playing a figure, but what fills in all those gaps is what's happening between the hi-hat and the snare drum. Usually, that's the way it kind of works. And so, you know, my favorite recordings that, that demonstrate that, you know, the, the ultimate recording is, is probably The Funky Drummer by, Clyde, by James Brown, played by Clyde Stubblefield. Um, I've spent most of my career trying to play that sample right. I think most drummers have. Um, but it's just one of those incredible discoveries that he made that day about how to use um, stick control to get varying dynamics um, and get varying colors out of the snare drum. And particularly the snare drum, that's what makes that groove so incredible is what he's doing with the left hand. And so another great exercise um, that I use to, to kind of train this ghost note language in the left hand particularly is um, around the Purdy Shuffle, made famous by the one and only Bernard Purdy. Um, as many of you are probably aware, Bernard Purdy is one of the most influential and recorded drummers and sample drummers in history. Um, and I have kind of taken a little bit of his concept around the Purdy Shuffle and tried to expand it. Um, and I don't know how successful I've been with it, but um, it's definitely something that's been hugely influential for me. And it revolves around this slow sextuplet feeling that he's playing between this loping pulse. And I, it's just, no one can play it like him. But um, it's definitely been very influential for me.
If I had any advice to offer a young player, I'd say be patient with yourself, first of all. Um, you know, it'll take you a while to maybe sound as good uh, as you think you sound in your head. You know, you're going to be working a lot through a lot of different technical challenges. So be patient with yourself. Be kind to yourself. Um, don't be so hard on yourself. Make sure you're always having fun. That's very, very important because the minute it stops being fun, um, I think that kind of diminishes the pursuit, you know. You, you should be really concentrating on, like, finding joy in music. There are so many musicians I wish I had met or played with. Um, I think about, you know, drummers uh, like Art Blakey, Elvin Jones. I would have loved to have had a conversation with Elvin. Not even just about his work with Train, but also just about his philosophy in playing and playing and uh, some of the things he might have been thinking about while he was playing, you know, um, and how much he put his heart into his music. Um, there are some great musicians I wish I'd play with. I never got a chance to play with Prince. I would have loved to play with him. Hopefully, he would have hired me. I don't know if he would have or not, but, um, and I would have loved to work with James Brown. That would have been sort of the ultimate test of groove, is working with him. Um, and I, I really wish that I had a chance to play with George Duke. He's a great musician, one of the sort of the, the heroes of my um, childhood and, and teenage years. I re really wish I had a chance to play with him. Uh, he was a, a really magical musician. Finding my voice as a drummer has been a, and continues to be a career long process. I mean, working with different people brings out different things in my playing. So, you know, having been in New York for 19 years and having met musicians who were playing on a very, very high level, um, it kind of makes you really step up and, and play to the best of your ability all the time. And then you start to, to take a step back and you realize, okay, well, maybe there's something in my playing that makes these different musicians call me. And so what is that thing? What is that thing? When you start to zero in on that, that is really what your voice is as an artist. And um, that, you know, New York really helped to shape that for me, being here and, and playing with so many great musicians. I switched from traditional to match grip several times throughout, you know, from song to song, sometimes within, several times within a song. Um, a lot of it depends on the sound I want to get out of the snare drum. I started playing marching band 
in, in high school and I was playing multi-time, so I was playing match grip. It wasn't until um, my, my freshman year in college I started marching snare and I started playing more uh, traditional grip snare drum. And I find that, you know, especially with drum sets, especially playing swing time, traditional grip gives me a wider dynamic range in terms of my ability to comp behind a soloist. Um, so, you know, switching back and forth seamlessly is, is really necessary for me. I know some drummers who can play the same grip, you know, fr from the first note of a gig to the last note, but I find that switching grips gives me not only a different sound, but also it helps me to sort of reset the, the muscles on the forearm too. It helps me stretch out sometimes. My creative process, you know, I am always thinking of um, different melodic ideas, different rhythmic ideas. Um, I, I you know, kind of walk around like most people. I have my, my phone and I have my voice memo on and I'm recording different rhythmic chants or I, maybe I'll have a melodic idea that I'll sing into it. And then I'll sit down at the piano or at the drums and I'll try to bring that idea, you know, to fruition. And as a band leader, I start to think about the musicians I want to play the ideas. So I'm, I'm kind of writing with the musicians in mind most of the time. Um, and you know, being a drummer as a band leader, I feel like I have the best seat in the house because I feel like I hear the, the music from the ground up. You know, I, f I feel like I hear the bass drum and the snare drum. It's in my mix, it's perfect, you know? Um, and I, I think that's a part of the reason why so many drummers become really great beat makers and producers because you know, we just have an ear for how the drums lay sort of a foundation for the rest of the music. Thank you. 